Aren't you thankful for this time of the year when we remember what Christmas really is, what it's all about? That it's not about toys, it's not about presents, it's not about the gifts that we bring. It's about Jesus and what He brought to us. Would you stand with us and sing this morning? We're going to open our time of worship this morning with this song, Behold Our God. service. Let's pray together and we'll ask God to bless our time together. Brother Tom Williams, would you please pray for us, sir? Amen. Please remain standing there as we continue to sing together, Jesus Messiah.
Hallelujah. What a Savior. And it's one of those timeless classics that never gets old and never wears out. It's such a powerful message in it as we sing about the life and the death of Jesus Christ. Let's sing this song together. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah. this morning we're going to take another old hymn that's one of those classic timeless songs that we sing right around Christmas time. We're going to put a little different tune to it, a little different spin to it. Glorious Day. Sing it with us. One day when heaven was filled with his praises One day when sin was as black as could be Jesus came forth Yeah. 
there and uh, we trust that God is honored by the praise of his people this morning and uh, we're glad to have you here I'll uh, I'll make you a wager um, whoever what man jumps up and turns the heat down just a little bit does not have to help with the offering plates today all right so somebody hop up there and turn that thing down just a little bit uh, before we all uh, start sweating in here all right it's amazing how warm it is, isn't it? It was so cold, and now it's warm again. This is like a southern fall. I feel like I'm back in Georgia, you know? Uh, it, got, it was hot all summer, and then it just turned cold, and the trees died and everything. It just felt like home, you know? Just it was great. So, uh, But uh, it's a little, little different here today, but we're glad that you're here today at Midway to Worship. We're going to dismiss our kids for Children's Church at this time. If you guys will hop up there, sixth grade and under, you guys are welcome to be dismissed. Uh, and... I hope you enjoy your time there in Children's Church. And the rest of us that are still here in the auditorium, let's go back to John uh, chapter 1. John chapter 1. We're going to kick off a new series of messages and this concept of patient with Christmas. Patient with Christmas. We'll talk about that here in just a minute, but uh, I want us to read here in John chapter 1 as we uh, begin rolling down this new track together. Uh, John chapter 1 gives us a little bit of a kickoff into this idea, and it's so important to our understanding of the Christmas story. The Christmas story, many times we started off with uh, Joseph and Mary, and even we go back a little further and we talk about Zachary. Zacharias and Elizabeth and their baby and uh, that story. But you know, the Bethlehem story goes back even further than that. And John chapter 1 introduces us to that. 
Uh, Matthew has a great account of the birth of Christ. Luke has a great account of the birth of Christ as well and the nativity story. But we can't leave out John chapter 1. It is so crucial to our understanding of how Christmas works, what Christmas is all about. John chapter 1, let's pick up our reading in verse number 1. The Bible says here, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shined in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And so let's pray together, and we're going to talk for just a few minutes when we're done praying about this idea of life out of light. Life out of light. Let's pray together and ask God to help us. Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for everybody that's here assembled today at Midway. We pray that you would help us as a church family. Uh, to love on one another, Lord, to fellowship with each other through the Holy Spirit, and Lord, uh, to encourage the guests that are here today, those that have chosen to uh, make this a part of their weekend. We pray that uh, you would bless them as well. Lord, we pray for those who uh, would be here but cannot be here for one reason or another, some sick, some traveling. We just pray for your blessings and mercy upon them. And Lord, we just pray that as we spend some time together in your word, Lord, I need your help. I need your wisdom. I need your power. I cannot deliver this message without the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Lord, it would all be in vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. So, Lord, we pray that you would speak to us now, Lord, that you would energize the message by your Spirit and speak to us now as only you can do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We've probably all heard uh, the, the statistic that depression and suicide increase uh, exponentially, astronomically, during the holiday season. Have you ever heard somebody say that, that depression and suicides go up during the holiday season? Well, fortunately, multiple studies have actually proven that to be untrue. It's actually not accurate. That's something that preachers need to stop saying because it's actually statistically not true. Um, in fact, the number not only doesn't increase, if you look at some studies, it actually decreases decreases during the holiday season. Uh, there's actually a group of researchers um, who use the National Center for Health Statistics to check suicide rates um, over the entire decade of the 1970s. On an average day, there were 34 suicides per million people. The holiday rates were down to 26 for Thanksgiving, 30 for Christmas and New Year's Eve, and below average on every major holiday except New Year's Day. The only uh, jump in the suicide rate uh, was at New Year's, uh, when you're coming out of the holiday season and you have to get back to life as you know it and life as normal. A lot of breakups happen right around New Year's, those kinds of things. So it actually increases then, but that's the only time that it increases. Uh, psychiatric visits to hospital emergency departments reach their lowest point of the year, one to two weeks before Christmas. So just a little information for you, just a little knowledge for you this morning, um, that that's not true. That'll make a great conversation piece around the, the, the Christmas table. Everybody loves to talk about suicide at Christmas dinner, right? But it's a sad thing. It's a sad thing that happens in our society. It happens too often. Uh, we probably, everyone in this room is affected by somebody who has taken their life. Um, but that one statistic is not true. But it is true that the holiday season increases stress, doesn't it? We all know what that feels like. The holiday season increasing that stress uh, level in all of our lives. There's dinners to prepare. There's family to invite over. To, you got phone calls to make to people you're not real happy with. And then you got to tolerate them at Christmas dinner. Uh, there's social dinners to attend that you've got to 
make room for on your calendar. There are Christmas cards to mail, family photos to take, and then we haven't even talked about Christmas gift shopping yet, you know? Um, how many of you are Christmas Eve shoppers? Anybody like that? You just wait till the last minute and go out on Christmas Eve? I see that hand, you know? My dad was that way. My dad would always wait until like December 23rd or December 24th to go shopping. And it wasn't that he was forgetful. He just, it was kind of his thing. And I remember going with him one time to Walmart on Christmas Eve. You know, there's nothing there. You know, you can't buy anything. Um, you've got to stand outside and beg people to give you what they've already bought because there's nothing left on the shelves and there's no sales left. They're charging you double price. You know, they're charging you full price uh, for the manufacturer suggested retail price for everything uh, there in the store that day. I remember being there and I was probably 10 or 11 years old. And we were walking around looking at all these bare shelves and all of these animals just running through the aisles, you know, just trying to find something to buy. And my dad's just, you know, being dad, walking down the aisles. I said, I'm just going to go over here to the video games and just going to hang out here for a while. And uh, you just come get me when you're done, I guess, because I, I, I don't know what to do in all of this mess. So I went and sat down and read a magazine. And dad came and got me. said, OK, we're ready to go. I got my calendars and belts. And, you know, that's about all he could scrape together. Uh, but it's, it's a stressful season. It's a stressful season. There's no doubt about it. Commercialism and family traditions can be very, very stressful. It's a lot of pressure. Um, there's actually an article that CBS News put out that says that some people will, this is for all of you who uh, start playing Christmas music back in October, um, this, this article is about you. So it's not me. I, I'm not saying anything about you. I got nothing against you. But CBS News has some information to hand over. So they say that, uh, that uh, just I'll give you a little bit of runway here. Some people excitedly throw on Christmas music the minute the temperature drops. Others have a hard rule. Wait until after Thanksgiving to start playing Christmas tunes. And some people just cannot stand Christmas music, especially if it is played too early into the holiday season. For those who would rather do without Jingle Bells, a psychologist in Great Britain thinks you may be onto something. Clinical psychologist Linda Blair says listening to music, Christmas music too early into the holiday season may affect mental health by triggering feelings of stress. Hearing a Christmas song can spark thoughts of all the things you have to do before the holiday, like shopping, party planning, and traveling. As the clock ticks down to December 25th, you may feel overwhelmed by your to-do list and being constantly reminded by the sound of sleigh bells ringing and ringing and ringing does not help. And let's not forget that the holiday season reignites a lot of emotional stress for those who have lost family or close friends. Serious difficulties, serious trials, things that we just breeze right through in the Christmas story when we read it to our children. But yet if we had to endure it, it would be life shattering life-shattering moments that they had to experience. And their examples help make Christmas more relevant to our lives, and I hope will help us be a little more patient with Christmas. So to begin our study on the birth of Jesus, we're going to go back further than Bethlehem. We're going to go back further than Mary and Gabriel. We're going to go back further than Zacharias in the temple with the angel. We're going to go all the way back through the Old Testament, all the way back through Jeremiah and Isaiah, back past David, back past Abraham. And we're going to go back as far back as anybody knows about what we call eternity past. John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Who is the Word that's mentioned here? It's none other than Jesus Christ Himself. This is a title that is given to Jesus over and over and over again in the New Testament, that He is the Word of God. And so we see here in this passage that there is relevance to Bethlehem, not just today, 2,000 years later, but 4,000 years before Bethlehem ever happened. Bethlehem had relevance. Christmas had relevance. It was important to God's plan all the way back in eternity past. While we're here today looking back on Christmas, that Christmas day, and talking about the birth of Jesus Christ, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were talking about Bethlehem. We're talking about the nativity story in eternity past. 
it has relevance not just today, but all the way back then. And so I want us to start here uh, with our study here in John chapter 1 and get a little understanding about the relevance uh, of this moment and life out of light. Verse number 4, it says here, talking about Jesus, talking about Him uh, being the Son of God and God Himself. Let's, let's just begin back in verse number 1 and work our way down. It says there in John chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him, not, without him was not anything made that was made. So this is not only God Himself in the Word, that Jesus is not only God, fully God, but it says that He's the Creator of everything. He's the Creator of this world. He's the Creator of this universe. Without Him was not anything made that was made. And then in verse number 4, it says, In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. Boy, that's a deep statement, isn't it? You just read it and you get a little confused. You know, what is that talking about? What does that mean? We need to understand what Jesus did for us in this life and in this light. And so this morning, I want us to focus on these two ideas, the light and the life. The light and the life. Let's start with the light. The light. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2, the Bible says that the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. This is a foreshadow of the coming of Jesus Christ. This is a prophecy of Jesus coming into the world and delivering light to this world. But he says here, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. Before we can talk about light and the importance of light, we have to understand the relevance of the darkness that he's talking about here. We have to wrap our minds around what he means when he talks about the darkness. Darkness in the Bible often refers to ignorance of truth. John chapter 12 verse 35 says, He that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. Jesus is saying there that if you're walking in darkness, you don't know what you're doing. You don't know where you're going. You don't know how to live life. You don't know how to experience life when you're walking in darkness. So it refers to ignorance of truth. It can also refer to destruction. Destruction. Jesus referred to hell as the outer darkness. The outer darkness, a place of destruction, a place of fear, a place of dread. It, it is a place of finality, the outer darkness. Darkness can also refer to a hidden life. A hidden life. Jesus said that men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. He's saying their people hide things about themselves. People there like to do things under the cover of secrecy. Very rarely do people rob, uh, you know, rob a house in broad daylight with the family there. If you do that, you are some kind of crazy. You are some kind of insane, and there's a real problem with you. Most of the time, thieves will wait until the cover of night when nobody's around, when nobody's there under secrecy. See. They want to hide their behavior. They want to hide their actions. And by the way, each and every one of us in this room today has a hidden part of our life. You have a part of your life that you would rather nobody know about. There's a part of your past that you would rather stay buried, that nobody would ever talk about, that nobody would ever ask you about. You hope that it never comes up in conversation about this, this topic, this regret in your life. Jesus came to shine a light on that darkness. He came to deal with that darkness. We are born into this world as blinded sinners. Our children, even, are born into this world as blinded sinners. They may be sweet, they may bring us a lot of happiness, but make no mistake about it, our kids are flawed at the very deepest level, just like you are, and just like I am. They are flawed, and they need to be dealt with, and we need to be dealt with. This blindness, this darkness must be taken care of. We are born into this life blinded by sin, which we try to hide. And so we begin our lives on a path that only leads to destruction, that darkness, that outer darkness. And the culture around us tries to remedy 
study that with psychology and sociology and science, and all of those serve a purpose, and they can do some good in some instances, but they fail to deal with the deepest darkness of all, and that is the darkness of our soul, the darkness of our hearts, our spiritual darkness. Jesus said that if the blind be leaders of the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. People ultimately don't have the solution to our darkness. They don't have, uh, they are not the light that we need. We need someone who isn't broken, someone who isn't blinded, to lead us to the light, to get us out of the darkness. Now, there are people in our lives who can point us towards the light, who can lead us to, towards the light that they have found in their own lives. But if we trust in people, we will be disappointed every time. If we depend on people for our joy, if we depend on people for our peace, you're going to be disappointed. Because why would you trust a blind person to lead you out of your blindness? Why would you trust a broken person to fix your brokenness? We need somebody who isn't blind. We need somebody who isn't broken to lead us out of these things. If our greatest problem had been ignorance, God would have sent us books. If our greatest problem had been poverty, God would have sent us money. If our greatest problem had been boredom, God would have sent us entertainment. But our greatest problem was darkness, so God sent us light. He sent us light in the person of Jesus Christ. John chapter 8, verse 12, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Jesus is that light. He is the source of that light. And so the call is to look unto Him. Not to look unto religion. Not to look on being a good person. Not to look unto charity and things like that. They all serve a purpose. They are good in their own way when they're exercised properly according to the Word, according to Christ, when they're surrendered to Him. But ultimately the call is to look unto Christ. To look unto Christ. In Isaiah it says, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. Not look unto a theologian, or to look unto a politician, or to look unto a system of politics. Look unto the Republicans, or look unto the Democrats. Look unto sociology, look unto psychology. No, it said, Look unto me. And be ye saved. Look to Christ. He is the source of light. But not only is He the light, but the Bible tells us here in John chapter 1, look there again with me. It says, In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The life was the light of men. This light extends from the life that Jesus has given. This light extends from the life that Jesus gives people. Can I say this, believer, if you're a Christian here this morning, if you know Christ and have given your heart to know Him and follow Him, you are to be a light because Jesus has put His life within you, and now you are to shine that light that extends from that life to all those around us. We are to bear witness of that light. Just like it says that John, he, John the Baptist, he bore witness of the light. It is our job to shine that light to other people as well because God's life in Jesus Christ has been given to us. This light extends from the life that Jesus gives. Without the life, there would be no light. So we have to deal with this life. We have to study this life. Because Jesus is alive, everything else is alive. You ever thought about that? Without Jesus, there would be nothing. There would be no life. He's the one who created it in the first place. He's the one who set the worlds in order. He's the one who set the stars in the sky. Without Him, we'd have nothing. Without Jesus, there is no life. Because Jesus is alive, you're alive. Because Jesus is alive, everything else is alive. Look at verse number 9. Notice this, what it says here about the extent of the light. And because of the extent of the light, the extent of the life. Think about that. Verse number 9, it says, That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. 
He has brought light to the whole world. And because He has brought light to the whole world, life is available to the whole world. And now we're not just talking about physical life, breathing and, and, and living and blood pumping through our veins. This is a deeper life. This is the life of something else. We're going to talk about what that means in just a minute. But uh, he tells us here that he has brought light to the whole world. Every, por every person born upon this earth is born with a basic knowledge of right and wrong. Every person born upon this planet has a basic knowledge of right and wrong. Now, we're not talking about how to set the speed limit or something like that. We're talking about that it's wrong to take human life unjustly. That it's wrong to kill other people for your own pleasure and you're taking advantage of them. It is wrong to steal. And in all four corners of this world, there are laws that match the basic tenets of Scripture. There are laws that teach us that it is wrong to commit adultery, that it is wrong to steal, that it is wrong to kill. Every society at some point or another has believed something about that, something similar to what God has taught us in His Word. We are born with a basic knowledge of right and wrong. We are born upon this earth with a desire to know truth. A desire to know truth. Maybe at a superficial level, but even at some level, we all have a desire to know truth. Now, there's some people who enjoy being lied to. And you watch uh, TMZ. <laughs> there are some people who enjoy being lied to. Who enjoy being deceived. There's a reason the National Enquirer sells so many copies. People do enjoy being lied to. They enjoy being deceived. But at, a, at some level, all of us want to believe that we know the truth. We want to believe that we have the truth. We may not have the discernment to know the difference between truth and error. But we would all like to believe that what we believe is the truth. That what we believe is right. Ecclesiastes says that the world has been placed within our heart. You know what that means? That means that the curiosity that you have to ask questions about how does this work and why does that exist and where did this come from? Those kinds of questions, those curious questions, God put that desire in your heart. God has placed even the idea of eternity in your heart. What is, what's out there beyond this life? What's out there beyond me once I take my last breath? Is there an unseen world beyond this one? We all ask those questions. We all want to know, is there an afterlife? Is there uh, another world out there, another realm that I can't see? We all ask those questions because God put within us a desire to know those things. We have a hunger to know. We have a hunger to explore and a hunger to learn. We even have an insight into the idea of eternity. Regardless of whether the Bible, the, 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 the scriptures, the Hebrew and the Christian scriptures uh, have been placed all around the world, regardless of whether the gospel has gone to a certain society, you can find in almost every culture even if they've never heard of Jesus Christ, even if they've never heard of the God of the Bible, there is some sort of belief in something beyond this life. That life doesn't end when you take your last breath. That life continues somewhere else. We all have an insight into the idea of eternity. Why? Why? Why do we have that light? Why did Jesus shine that light upon all of us when he created us? So that we will seek the life. So that we will seek God. So that we will follow the breadcrumbs, the trail of light back to the source where the life is to be found. This enlightenment, as the Bible says here in verse number 9, this enlightenment that God has done in our lives, the purpose of it is to make us desire more light. To seek more light, to seek more understanding, to seek more truth, so that we will eventually find our way to the one and only source of light and life, Jesus Christ. We need to understand a few things about the life of Jesus. First of all, think about this. The Word is alive. 
The Word is alive. It says in John chapter 1, verse 1, that Jesus is the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, with God and the Word was God. Jesus is the living, breathing Word of God. Everything that God wanted to say to us, He has said it through Jesus Christ. He has displayed it to us through Jesus. Go over to Hebrews chapter 1. I want you to read this uh, two verses of Scripture with me. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 1. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 1. The book opens with this statement. It says, God who at sundry times and in divers manners, and if you're wondering what that means, it means at different times in different places, uh, God has, sp uh, He spake un in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. So he says here, throughout history, God has delivered His word, His message to us through the prophets. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Elijah, Elisha, all of these heroes of the Old Testament, God used Use them to get his message to us. But then it says in verse number two, God hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he also, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So he says here that in the Old Testament, God used the prophets to communicate truth. How did God communicate truth to us in this New Testament era, in these last days? He did it through His only begotten Son. He did it through Jesus Christ Himself, yea, God Himself in the flesh. And now everything that God has wanted to say to us, has wanted us to know, we can find in Jesus Christ. We can see it in Him, in His, in His example, in His words, in His character. Everything that you need to know about what really matters in life, you can find out in Jesus. You can get the answer in Jesus and from Jesus. The Word is alive. And even the very book that you're holding in your lap there, or looking at on your cell phone or tablet, it is alive. The Bible says that the Word is quick and powerful. The word quick means alive. There's life there. There's vitality. There's energy there. It's amazing how after all these years of studying the Word and, and wanting to know God through the Bible and studying passages like John chapter 1, I can open it up as just sitting on my porch the other day uh, reading the Word and seeing all kinds of things that I never even thought about before. Things that, uh, connections that God was making in my mind about, that's why God said that in this other passage over here because of what He's saying right here. The Word is alive. The, the, there is life in the Word of God. There's life in Jesus Christ Himself. So if the Word is alive, then we need to understand this as well, that He, Jesus, the Word, is the source of life. Jesus is the source of life. You are alive today. Why? Because Jesus is alive, and He has decreed you to be alive. He has ordered you to be alive today. He is the source of life. But what about beyond this life? What about when my heart stops beating, and my brain stops functioning, and my lungs stop breathing? What about beyond this life? How is it possible to live beyond this life for all of eternity? How does that work? Well, the Bible explains that to us. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, the Bible says that you are more than one body within this body. That you are one person in three parts. It says there that your whole body, soul, and spirit. There are, there's one person here standing up on this platform today, but this one person is really three pieces that make up this one body. And it's a picture of the Trinity. It's a picture of the triune God, that there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, but yet they are all together one singular God. And so uh, it is a picture of the Trinity. That's what the Bible means when it says that you are made in God's image. You're made in His likeness. There's similarities in the way that God has designed us with the way that God is structured, the way that God exists. So let's break that down a little bit. 
those three parts. First of all, you have a physical body. Obviously, I'm looking at it. You're looking at mine. Some are more dressed uh, in, in finer clothes. Some of you are dressed in jeans and t-shirts. It, it, but we're all physical, right? Is that the most important part of who we are? Our physical body, our physical embodiment? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Some of us have uh, more hair than others do. Uh, some of you just outgrew your hair. That's all that happened there. You didn't, it wasn't your fault. Some of us have straight teeth. I have crooked teeth. I'm mad at all you straight teeth people. I'm secretly bitter against all of you about that, you know. Uh, some of us have, uh, you know, some of us are longer this way and some of us are longer that way, you know. It's, we're, we're all different. From the way that we look to the clothes that we wear, we're all different. We have this physical body, and it's adorned differently. But the physical body that you have contains some other things. It is a container. It is a vessel. It is a jar uh, that contains some other things. It contains a soul and a spirit, which are immaterial. We can't put you under an x-ray and say, oh, there's your soul. Or there's where your spirit lives. You know, your spirit's looking a little sick. We better get you some medicine for that. It, it doesn't work that way, does it? There's an immaterial part, immaterial components uh, of all of us. And let's talk about the soul for a minute. What is the soul? The soul is the part of you where sin is based. The soul is the part of you where sin resides. But it's also the part of you where your intellect, your emotions, and your willpower reside. It is the decision-making, the thinking, the uh, experiencing part of your person. It is the part of you that is, makes you conscious of yourself, that makes you conscious of your existence in this world. The physical body makes us conscious of everything around us, right? We have the five senses, taste, touch, uh, smell, sound, sight. I think that's five. Um, but we have all of those so that we can experience the physical world around us. We can see, we can hear. The soul helps us experience ourselves. It helps us understand ourselves. But then there's a third component. The third component is the spirit. The spirit. The spirit was given to you by God when you were conceived in your mother's womb. It is the part of you that interacts with the unseen spiritual world. It is your connection to the spiritual realm. It is the part of you that speaks with God through prayer. When we pray, it's not the words that are literally coming out of our mouth. It's not the sound waves that get to heaven, right? Because the sound waves never leave this building. They never leave this room. But yet the spirit within us takes those words and communicates our heartbeat, communicates our emotions, communicates everything about us as a person as we pray, as we speak to God. It communicates that to heaven itself. The Spirit is your connection to the world that you cannot see. If you're a believer, it's the part of you that gets excited when you think about the Lord, when you think about forgiveness, when you think about salvation. It's the part of you that, that breaks when God deals with your sin. It's the part of you that is crushed when you think about the weight and the size of your sin and my sin. That is your spirit communicating with you. But the problem is that this most important, this deepest part of us is actually dead. It's dead. It's lifeless. When you proceed from your mother's womb, you are spiritually dead already. Even though you have just been brought into this world, brought into new life, you are spiritually stillborn. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Dead. 1 John chapter 3, verse 14 says, We know that we have passed from death unto life. 
meaning that we're born into this world in a state of spiritual death. There's a spirit within you, but there's something wrong with it. There's something very sick and ill to the point of death. It is cut off. It is cut off from God. It is cut off from salvation. It is cut off from grace. It is cut off from all those things. And so we need somebody to enliven us. Not just to enlighten us, but to enliven us. There are a lot of people today sitting in churches just like this one who have heard the truth a thousand times. They've been in church since they were kids. They know the verses. They know the verses to all the songs and to all the Bible uh, that uh, the, the preacher is saying when he says John 3.16, they're already saying it in their head. There are people that have the light. But that's not the question this morning. The question is, do you have the life? Do you have the life? Because the light was meant to bring you to a place of life. Our greatest need is not just light. Our greatest need is life, vitality, energy, a relationship with God. Your spiritual life is dead when you come into this world. And so because of that, there's nothing that you can do uh, spiritually that will be of any benefit. You can't be good enough for God. You can't be uh, a, a big enough giver for God. You can't be charitable enough to make a dent with God because you're cut off from Him. There is a wedge, there's a wall between you and God when you come into this world. And it's the same for me. When I came into this world, there was a wall between me and God that had to be torn down so that I could have life in God, in Jesus Christ. Any religion that tries to put a dead man to work spiritually without fixing their deadness is itself a dead religion. I'm going to repeat that for you because I think it bears repeating. Any religion that tries to put a dead man to work spiritually without fixing their deadness is a dead religion itself. Is it a problem? Uh, that people are stealing from one another. Yes, it's a problem, but that's not the most basic problem. Is it a problem, uh, this adultery that seems to be so widespread in our world today? Yes, it's a problem, but it's not the most basic problem. See, I think one of the issues that we've had as churches, and the church, so to speak, is we've tried to fix these issues. We've tried to teach people, don't, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, be an honest person. And those are all good things to teach, and I'm going to teach it to my daughter as well. But have we missed the basic problem? Have we tried to fix all these outlying issues without getting to the heart of it and realizing that the real issue, the real problem, the real conflict that needs to be addressed is that we are spiritually dead without Christ. When somebody who doesn't know Christ and somebody who's unsaved does something that we think is, as you know, church folks, when they do something that we think is just appalling, don't be surprised. What should lost people do but act lost? What should dead people do but act like dead people? Don't hate them for that. Don't get on their case about that and say, hey, you need to quit doing that unless they're endangering somebody else's life. That what you need to do is go to them and say, hey, do you know Christ? Do you know the Savior? Because I don't know that you would do that if, if you really knew Christ, if you really knew the Lord. They don't need a lecture on morality. They need a witness. They need somebody to shine the light of Jesus Christ to them. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, we have this beautiful passage. In fact, why don't you turn there with me? Ephesians chapter 2, and we'll close here today. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 1. It says here in Ephesians 2, verse 1, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. You notice the past tense there? He says, who were dead in trespasses and sins. What does he mean when he says, you hath he quickened? 
Well, we talked about the word quick before in Hebrews 4 verse 12 that the word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. What does the word quick mean? It means alive. Alive. And it says here, you hath he quickened, you hath he enlivened, you hath he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. You know, the beautiful promise of Scripture, the beautiful promise of the Gospel is that that deadness doesn't have to be a permanent state. Because Jesus raises people from the dead. The one who raised Lazarus from the dead and brought him out of that tomb can reach into your deadness and bring life to it. He can bring redemption and forgiveness and life to all the deadness that your life contains. Go to verse number 5. He says, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. All the deadness that's existing in your life today, if you will give yourself to Jesus Christ, can I tell you this? God will bring some life to it. God will enliven your life. And by the way, there's plenty of light in this room today from people that could tell you the difference that Jesus Christ has made in their life. The difference He made the day they gave their heart and life to Him. The difference He made in their family. The difference He made in their own personal decisions. The difference that He is still making today in all of our lives. Give yourself to Jesus Christ today. Eternal life is something that every person can have, regardless of your social status or wealth or knowledge. Jesus didn't come for the lower class. He didn't come for the middle class. He didn't come for the upper crust. He came for everybody. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Just like Jesus can shine His light to the whole world, He can give His life to the whole world as well. In fact, He did give his life for the whole world. We begin the Christmas season by talking about the birth of Jesus Christ. That's what Christmas is all about, right? But it's the beginning of the story, isn't it? It's just the first chapter in an incredible life that finishes at Calvary. When Jesus Christ chose, as a grown man, 33 years of age, chose to be nailed to a cross and to bleed out his own precious lifeblood and to die on that cross. Why? Because he was a terrible person? No, even Pilate himself, even the governor of the Romans there said, there's no fault in this man, why are we crucifying him? There was no crime that he committed that was uh, worthy of death. There was no crime that he committed at all. Why did he die? He did it for you. He did it so that his death would mean new life for you and for me. When Jesus died on that cross, when he poured out his lifeblood, he died to pay for every sin that you and I have ever committed. But can I tell you this? That's actually not the end of the story. There's an afterword. There's an epilogue to the story. And it goes like this. Sunday morning, three days later, the tomb that he was buried in burst open. The stone was rolled away from the door, and Jesus Christ came out of that grave alive forevermore, and He's alive today. Can I tell you this? Bethlehem is not just about the new life that we see in a stable, in a manger. It leads us to the new life that Jesus gives to all of us, and He proved that He can give it to us when He Himself came back to life, when He Himself conquered death and hell in the grave. He proved that He can conquer your death. He can conquer your hell. He can even overcome the grave itself. Can we pray together? Let's bow our heads and our hearts this morning. Lord, we come to you today.